Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, good afternoon uh, to uh, to you uh, in the um, in the east, and good uh, good morning to the rest of you uh, around the country. Uh, my name is Joe Aiello. I am the national field coordinator for the Rail Passenger Association. Welcome to a very special uh, webinar event we're hosting today. Um, I, I kind of want to get started right away. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our president and CEO, Jim Matthews, uh, and he will introduce our, our guests. I uh, hope everyone's doing well. Jim Matthews here. I'm president and CEO of the Rail Passengers Association, and I am joined today by uh, Larry Chesler, who is the vice president for long distance at Amtrak and also wears many other hats, some of them official and some of them unofficial. <laughs> um, but uh, Larry's here to talk about uh, service issues, about the future, about new train sets, about a lot of things that have been on all of our minds here for the past few months for Amtrak. Uh, and we have a short time to, to spend here, so I don't wanna spend a lot of time on an introduction, uh, but everybody knows Larry. Uh, and uh, he has very graciously agreed to join us again today. I think you are probably close to our, our most frequent webinar guest. So welcome for the multiple time. Uh, Larry Chesler. Larry, nice to nice to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Jim, are you able to hear me okay? We can. We can. You're good. Okay. Well, there may be a, a little bit of a lag, but we'll make it work. Uh, it's good to be with you and your and your team uh, today. And uh, I've got uh, some material for us to review uh, and looking forward to the discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to see if I can advance my screen. Okay. Are you able to see uh, an agenda for today? I can see that and uh, I hope everybody else can. Whoops. All right, I think I've got it. So uh, we will uh, cover a couple of different things and uh, certainly uh, have time, Jim, for, for uh, questions uh, and follow-ups, but feel free to, to uh, ask questions along the way. Um, we're going to talk about our service restoration, which as you know, we've been through a number of chapters. Um, and really want to uh, discuss how we are thinking about uh, bridging to the future, um, which is to say the, the future that we're very excited about is the long distance fleet replacement. Uh, but of course we have to be very patient because that is uh, not something that's going to happen quickly. And we need, to, uh, we need to be able to support the long distance network between now and then and, uh, and that's part of our uh, vision for, for getting there. Um, and I also want to spend some time talking about uh, what happened this past summer. Um, and the, uh, as you know, we, we dealt with a number of uh, service disruptions um, as a uh, result of uh, kind of pushing our, our boundaries of uh, operation and facing all kinds of complications that uh, that are part of our um, normal normal life uh, at running the long distance network. But we'll talk more about that as well. So uh, I'll go ahead and take us to the first slide here. Um, and importantly, our you know we we've uh, we've restored our service uh, effective last month. Um, with a little a bit of hiccup because of the hurricane in Florida. Um, we did restore the Silver Meteor to daily service, and we restored uh, from five a week to daily back on the city of New Orleans and the Crescent. Um, and that completed our uh, service restoration from the actions that we took back in January of this year. Um, of course, that was the Omicron chapter of the uh, of the pandemic, uh, and uh, as we all know, we we had two major reductions to the long distance service uh, through the course of uh, the pandemic. The first was in 2020, 
uh, when we reduced significantly to three a week frequencies on most of the network. Um, and as we uh, recovered from the pandemic and vaccines came out and the world uh, stabilized, uh, we met our uh, commitments uh, and restored service uh, as planned in the May and June time period um, last year. Uh, but of course, you know, followed, you know, less than a half a year later with the, with the disruptions and the, the need to reduce service a second time. Um, so we're delighted to be uh, back from all of that and uh, to have the service uh, in terms of restored. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but we will continue to have our total capacity uh, will be below pre-pandemic levels because of uh, uh, issues with our, our car availability, which we'll talk more about. Um, okay. So um, as we talk about our fleet and bridging to the future, a couple of key things. First, uh, as you know, we've, we've uh, we placed an initial order and then uh, options for uh, new locomotives for the uh, primarily for the long distance uh, uh, service. And um, that in total will be 125 locomotives and they are arriving. They are, uh, you've uh, hopefully seen some of them in service. Um, we have 19 total that have been delivered to Amtrak uh, and uh, majority of those are actually in service. Uh, you know, it takes some time for us to go through commissioning process and have them ready to, uh, uh, to go. But uh, we're really excited about that. That's important and uh, it's well underway. So that's, that's good news. Um, you also, we've talked about the interior refresh program. Uh, we've had some, uh, uh, some trouble with our timelines, but we're uh, making good headway now um, and of the 400 or so cars that will be in the total program we've completed about 60 coaches uh, that are that are in service um, including uh, all of the coaches on the auto train which is nice um, and the, the work on uh, other car types uh, is finally set to begin in January with uh, parts uh, issues resolved and and uh, 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 work resources ready to, to get going on that. So uh, we're, we're encouraged that the pace will, will uh, start to pick up in terms of uh, getting those superliners with the new interiors uh, back out into, uh, into the operation. In addition, we'll be a similar program for the new liner one sleepers um, a little bit of a different, different program and the intention to uh, uh, include a, uh, some other elements that uh, has us back in uh, to a, a design effort, um, but those will, will be teed up to be addressed when the Superliner program is completed. And as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the long distance capacity uh, in this fiscal year is expected to be uh, about 11% less than what than our pre-COVID uh, plan. Um, and so even with full frequency restoration, our, our services is, is uh, a little bit reduced and that is driven by fleet availability. Um, and as, as you know, there, you know the, the, a couple of major decisions uh, and, uh, well, a couple of major action, uh, unfortunate uh, events when we derailed both in Montana and in Missouri that uh, uh, impacted our fleet availability with, with some pretty significant damage and, uh, uh, and um, cars that are going to need to be uh, uh, fully assessed of what of, uh, what we can accomplish in terms of getting them reactivated. And um, as we've also spoken about in the past, in, in as during the pandemic, uh, we made decisions about resource 
uh, availability and about uh, the amount of work that that uh, we could accomplish um, and and made the decision to idle some equipment. And uh, a, a lot of that equipment has been restored to service, especially on our uh, single level fleet uh, uh, and for uh, coaches in particular. Um, but a, a number of pieces of equipment that were idled at that time are still uh, queued up for, um, for needing um, overhaul work to be done and scheduling that to be accomplished along with all of the uh, baseline of overhaul work uh, has, is something we haven't been able to get fully into a calendar yet. But that is uh, something we have really turned our attention to and over the coming uh, weeks, I hope to have a, a definitive plan uh, related to not only the, the idled equipment and uh, timeline for reactivation, but also uh, an assessment of all of the equipment that has been uh, damaged, not only in these two uh, major events, but in various other uh, 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 impacts that have, have occurred, uh, other uh, more smaller scale events of, of, of striking uh, uh, equipment or other kinds of uh, events that have happened. With all of that, though, we, uh, you know, we, uh, if we can, uh, we may not be able to close the entire 11% gap. Uh, we certainly won't close it in 2023, but as we move into 2024 and beyond, the intention is to uh, restore as much of the equipment as is feasible and, uh, and build a timeline for accomplishing all of that so that we can reintroduce uh, as much of that equipment into the long distance network. So we're close, uh, you know, uh, but we're not, we're not quite where we'd like to be. Jim, did you have a question? Yeah, just a clarification uh, before we go on. This is fiscal 23, right? So when you talk about maybe into 24, that's maybe November or December-ish, or would we should we be thinking more into calendar 24? Um, yeah, good question. I, I don't uh, I don't think we have a full line of sight on that just yet. Um, but uh, optimistically, uh, by the start of fiscal 24, more realistically, probably in calendar 24. Okie doke. Okay. All right. Uh, other, uh, let me advance. <clears throat> also part of bridging of the future is continuing to uh, focus on improvements to our Product offerings, and uh, you know that the the, uh, the interior refresh, of course, is a really important part of that. There are other elements related to our uh, service. Uh, it goes back a ways now, but we are uh, you know really thrilled with the success of the restoration and sort of the upgrading and reimagining of the traditional dining that occurred uh, a year ago last summer. Um, <clears throat> which um, has been uh, well received and uh, I think well delivered by our team. Um, we do have uh, uh, plans. We have not yet sort of put a final date on the calendar, but our intention uh, of upgrading to a traditional dining style of service on the Silver Star and the Silver Meteor is expected in early 2023. And, uh, you know, we are. Uh, been, the team has been working actively on that, on uh, making sure that we uh, have uh, the tools and resources and materials in place to execute on that uh, in the early part of next year. So that will be a, um, a meaningful um, step, and, and we think it's a, a good fit for those uh, services, and it's a good place for us to really uh, see how that can go on, on a single level equipment. The other, uh, another thing that uh, uh, customers have expressed, a, you know, a concern about, and I think has been, uh, Jim, something that you and your members have been 
focused on is the uh, access of coach customers to experiencing our dining services. Um, and we have, uh, we have had in place a pilot program on the Coast Starlight um, and introduced a different approach to customer access uh, through a, rather than a menu-based uh, offering that it's a fixed price uh, offer for the meal period, whether it's uh, breakfast or lunch or dinner. And we're offering it uh, on the Coast Starlight on a, on a uh, as available basis. Um, and we started with uh, making that offer to our business, uh, our business class customers. And we are uh, imminently going to expand that to, uh, it, to all of the customers, uh, seated customers on the train on a, a space available basis. And uh, we're also, um, I think very close to rolling out that to a couple of additional trains um, to uh, make sure that we that that process is robust and that we're ready to do it uh, 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 more broadly. So um, more to come on that, but uh, we're excited to be to be able to offer that. It seems to have uh, will be working well and and meeting with some good uh, satisfaction on the Coast Starlight. And so we're happy to, to, uh, to expand that. And along the way, we've, we've continued to make other improvements to uh, our, our other offerings. We've made a recent uh, upgrade to the cafe menus, the national cafe uh, offerings and continue to uh, uh, try the new and improved uh, products to offer more variety and more quality and more choice for, for customers. Uh, and the same thing is true with the flexible dining menus as we uh, refresh the meal offerings and, and uh, improve the, the service quality and the delivering of that, of that product as well. So um, continuous focus on making the customer experience better. So let's talk about the long distance fleet replacement, which uh, you know is uh, obviously an important initiative to uh, replace our, our aging fleet uh, and uh, both single level and, and bi-level equipment that, that are uh, in that category of, of needing to be uh, uh, addressed, replaced over, over the you know, coming years. Um, and we really want to, you know, we are we're focusing now on uh, identifying and really trying to be uh, anticipate what the needs of our customers will be in the future, and, and what what can we do to improve the customer experience with the new fleet? And there's a lot of things we can do, and and uh, the world has changed a lot since uh, the the equipment that we uh, operate has, was built. Um, we hope to improve our operating economics um, by, by having a more efficient uh, fleet and uh, uh, being able to uh, run our network more, more effectively with, uh, with more commonality in our uh, fleet types. And of course, increasing uh, sustainability and accessibility are important objectives. And uh, as I mentioned, fleet standardization uh, will allow us to have more operational flexibility and ideally to reduce our maintenance costs as well. So those are a lot of the big picture uh, uh, objectives of, of growing the, uh, of replacing fleet. And this effort is well underway at Amtrak and uh, our, our, I wrote capital development here, but I meant to say capital delivery our capital delivery team uh, is, you know, formed just this year under the leadership of Laura Mason. And uh, not only are they working on the major uh, infrastructure projects uh, and uh, Amtrak's execution of those, but also focusing on the fleet, the fleet uh, delivery projects, both the, the new Acela program and the ICT program, and now uh, leading the efforts uh, company-wide alignment on the long distance fleet replacement. 
And so uh, our, the commercial team uh, and the product development teams are actively uh, engaged in uh, efforts with uh, market research and uh, uh, developing our business model um, as we think about how our, we can serve customers differently uh, in the future and maybe the mix of our, uh, of our room types that we offer, maybe different kinds of room types than what we offer today. Uh, uh, how, how do we take advantage of this great opportunity to use new equipment um, and make it most effective for serving the needs of our customers? So we're already getting uh, design concepts uh, underway and, and sort of opening the lens broadly to what that, what that future fleet capability can be. Um, in terms of key milestones, we will be going out uh, before the end of this calendar year with a request for information to uh, manufacturers and to begin to really engage with the, with the car building community in terms of what, uh, you know, what their interests are, what their capabilities are, what their ideas are uh, that can help inform this process. Um, before we go out back to them again uh, at, at, in a time of next fall, with the targeting with a request for proposal, a more formal uh, uh, outreach to request um, uh, uh, bids for uh, our by then a specific specification and and uh, uh, detailed proposal for what we think we need for the replacement. And uh, our, our target and timeline is that by uh, to reach a, a conclusion and to actually have an order uh, in place by the end of 2024. So it's, a, it's an aggressive uh, and ambitious timeline, but we really are uh, getting, leveraging the learnings of the fleet procurements that have preceded this effort. Um, this is different. Uh, it's, there's unique complications around the long distance fleet because of the service elements that are not uh, typical to, uh, to the other uh, fleets in the organization. But nonetheless, the process uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the methods to get, to, to get through this uh, and to make sure that we're aligned and achieving the key milestones uh, is, is I think we are a beneficiary of being third in line. Um, and uh, so well underway, lots of engagement, uh, finance team, the procurement team, uh, mechanical and operations, uh, of course, and under the, or the organizing and, and uh, uh, structuring of the effort by our capital delivery organization. So, um, it's really great to be engaged in this at this point. Um, it's really exciting. I know uh, this is something of great interest to, to all of us and uh, um, all of you on this uh, on this call. So more to come on that. Um, all right, uh, Jim, I'd like to just shift a little bit and talk uh, a bit about um, what we've, what, uh, what happened this past uh, summer, uh, which is not widely out of line with what's happened in previous uh, peak seasons at Amtrak, but nonetheless, um, you know, we faced a number of challenges, some of our own doing, a lot of them uh, uh, external. Um, and, um, you know, just for some context, we had, um, we had, uh, at least 39 host railroad derailments that uh, it's amazing how frequently that, that kind of thing happens and that causes disruptions or, or even cancellations to our network. Uh, and in addition, lots of natural disasters or weather emergencies and other kinds of disruptions um, that, uh, you know, are, are uh, part of our environment and part of what happens uh, but we seem to be uh, dealing with increased frequency and, and increased severity. 
um, heat waves or, or you know, uh, situations where our host railroads uh, impose heat orders because of track conditions um, has also been ramping up. And, uh, and it's an unfortunate impact on our, on our business. Um, and of course, ultimately this impacts our customers. Um, and some of, some of our issues are uh, making sure that we are taking care of customers as these situations develop. Um, we've, I think we've gotten better uh, and we have, uh, we have more progress to make, but there's been a lot of focus and I wanted to share with this group a little bit about, about what we're doing. Um, just a little bit of uh, data for some context. The, um, this just demonstrates over the, over the latest period what is a, a pretty typical relationship the blue bars on this chart. Uh, on I'm sorry, it looks like the slide isn't showing up. That's okay. right, we're good. All right, thank you, Jim. Um, so the, uh, this just, the, there's a typical and strong correlation between uh, uh, customer on time performance, um, which is represented in this chart by the blue bars and, and significant reductions uh, um, in OTP over the course of the summer, the scale for the blue bars is on the right side of the graph. And the, uh, the lines are, are the, the CSI scores in total you know, at the top, uh, uh, or for sleepers at the top, and the total and coach numbers that look that are pretty closely aligned in the, uh, in the middle of the graph. And of course, you know, in the summer, our, our CSI scores were uh, very rough, uh, and our on customer on time performance was very rough as well. Um, but uh, <clears throat> um, so, so uh, without further ado, I mean, th this is this remains one of the key uh, opportunities for us. Uh, and uh, the next slide, well, this shows the summer heat wave impact in particular, uh, comparing this past summer to 2019. And uh, you can see in general, the, the weather related delays that are uh, the primarily uh, in this category are, are the heat, uh, heat interruptions or, or heat. Uh, yeah. Um, so, and, and uh, unfortunately, you know, significantly higher uh, this, past year and whether that's long-term trend or, or uh, bad luck this year, but I guess time will tell that that's uh, one of the climate impacts, I think that are a real part of our business. This chart just shows uh, in, in terms of fleet availability, as we talked about, you know, we have, uh, uh, especially in our superliner fleet compared to uh, uh, just 2019, you can see how we have uh, about 30 fewer cars, both in the Superliner 1 fleet and in the Superliner 2 fleet uh, for this, you know, variety of reasons. And, you know, some of that is our own business decisions, as we've discussed in terms of some uh, equipment that was idled. Uh, but a, a big portion of it has to do with, the, with uh, you know, wrecks and damaged cars. Um, at least half of this uh, figure is related to that, um, and uh, and uh, various constraints just in terms of getting our our uh, overhaul work completed. But uh, you know this is this is uh, this is what we need to address as part of that bridging to the future. Is how do we close this gap and and uh, get as much of this equipment back uh, back into service. One of the key issues related to that, as we've talked about, is uh, is our workforce, um, and in in just in this uh, in this in the fiscal year of 22, we hired over 3,200 uh, new employees. Um, you know, a combination of growth and and uh, replacement of attrition, but that's in a it's a huge number, and we've never hired that many people in a, in a year. And we're, our goal for this coming year is to is to hire even more than that. The good news is we've built a you know a pretty good machine in 2022, 
to, uh, to achieve that level of recruitment and hiring and training. But we've got a lot of work yet to do uh, in, in a number of crafts. Um, and uh, so we're, you know, we're far from, we're far from where we need to be, but we're getting there. And, uh, and it's, you know, as, as, as uh, you know, there's um, attrition uh, is a meaningful part of the issue, but also just growth uh, to, to accomplish more work and, and what we're, uh, you know, uh, all of our ambitions for growth at Amtrak. So um, no surprise to you that the, uh, um, you know, the training and qualification timelines for some of these positions is a, is a really long uh, uh, road. And that's part of the challenge is not only getting, getting the people on board, but uh, getting them ready to go. Um, but we're making really good progress. Our recruiting uh, efforts and uh, uh, hiring events have been uh, really building and having more success and uh, we're really hitting some strides. So it's encouraging, uh, but work is not done. And this is a, a chart um, I wanted to share that just provides a little more context around that in terms of where we need to be over on the far right of this uh, uh, chart in terms of uh, what we need to operate our fiscal 23 plan. And, uh, you know, where, where we were, which wasn't too much different than that before the pandemic um, on the far left. And as we opened the gates and started to uh, uh, hire in the fall of last year, you know, we had dropped pretty significantly in terms of our uh, available staff across all of the, 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 these key functions. And by the, by the end of the fiscal year, we've made, uh, we've made some good uh, progress in terms of bodies, but uh, um, what you see in sort of the light colored uh, bars in the second to last column is that even with all those people, because of that training and qualification and timeline, we still have a, you know, we have a pretty big gap still to fill to get to where we need to be. So again, uh, really important progress made um, and the company uh, achieving hiring levels that are unprecedented, um, but the work is not finished. So I hope that provides some context and uh, utility for you. Um, a few more things um, in terms of uh, the disruption in this past summer. Um, this is a, a bit of a, 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 a twofold story, but we've spent, we're spending, we spent almost $3 million uh, just in the summer months this year in terms of service recovery. Partly it's because there was a lot of recovery to be accomplished, but also because I think we have uh, increased our focus on finding better solutions for, for customers and, uh, and being more mindful of providing the uh, care and accommodation and meals and uh, other alternate transportation um, than what was our, our historic practice. So both, uh, you know, more events, but also more commitment to providing appropriate service recovery is uh, evidenced by this comparison to uh, about five years ago. And I wanted to share a few other things that we've been, uh, uh, that we've done uh, to improve our customer uh, service, our customer experience um, with regard to uh, communications. Uh, we've been improving our self-service tools, our ability for customers when their travel is disrupted instead of having to call or, or you know, queue up in a line or uh, address their, their uh, rebooking or their, uh, tr their adjustment to their plans, uh, our, our tools in, uh, are now in place for when a trains are canceled that customers can use their 
their own tools uh, and and uh, uh, more quickly get get the, a, a resolution for their for their situation. They can still contact us if they need help, but uh, we, we've done, uh, this has been, I think, well received and, and successful in streamlining the process. We are uh, 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 just imminently increasing this capability, not only for canceled trips, but for delayed trains as well, that we would activate these self-service tools uh, you know, in certain situations that will give customers that uh, even even more control. And that's, uh, uh, if it is, it may have actually happened in the last week. Um, if not, it's, it's right at the doorstep. Um, we've also, this summer, uh, began a, a more proactive effort of reaching out to customers uh, in delay situations, especially on the long distance network. And, uh, you know, Finding uh, finding ways to um, to bring satisfaction to the customer rather than waiting for them to say I had a problem and this was what it was and there's my complaint that we said look we know that that you were on this delayed train and here's what we propose to do about it and so uh, I think a step in the right direction and also uh, well received so far. Um, dating back a little bit further, but I think uh, important to just highlight uh, the baseline in, in our operations center. We've we've been uh, we've had in place a customer communications team for several years now. We've been uh, improving the channels and the and the methods of communication that we have uh, over time. So uh, you know we reach customers through social media. Uh, we added capability uh, to our Amtrak app to be able to communicate with customers. Um, this function started as a fledgling effort. It's now staffed, uh, a, a, you know, 24/7, 365, um, and we're on the cusp. I think early next year to be able to uh, uh, leverage text messaging as a way to communicate directly with customers, um, which you know, uh, uh, like to think is something we, you know, would be not not so far out of our reach, but it was uh, uh, some some technical challenges that uh, we're working through and, and really, I think, will reach a much broader group of customers in terms of timely uh, information about, uh, about uh, operation situations. And uh, furthermore, I think improving, you know, with that customer communications team is turning its attention more to providing uh, information that's well aligned across not only what our customers hear, but the uh, information that, that we ask our frontline employees to relay to customers as well. And sometimes we haven't been, uh, you know, uh, it can be inconsistent. We have some employees who do that very well and others who uh, you know, could use some more sort of framing and coaching and, and some uh, messaging to support that. So working on that, and I think it's making a difference. Uh, wanted to talk briefly just about the situation that I, I know was, uh, you know, uh, uh, was top of mind uh, just last month when we had a, a, a uh, disruption event in Michigan with a loss of head end power and, uh, you know, a, a very uh, overly long uh, timeline for, for resolution of that situation and, uh, you know, what ended up being a, a really uh, uh, unfortunate uh, customer experience in that regard. Um, we've put in place some new procedures related to that and uh, focusing on specifically these kind of situations where loss of head end power can, you know, creates uh, an environment on the train that is, uh, can be especially uncomfortable or, or even dangerous depending on, on conditions. Um, and so I won't walk through the details of this other than to say that the, you know, it's a fast timeline about engaging, uh, making sure the right parties are engaged and escalating uh, as appropriate um, to make sure that the situation is resolved promptly and uh, that 
senior leaders in the company and uh, are are fully engaged early on uh, to make sure that that you know we don't let a situation linger. And uh, had a chance already to to experience this uh, this process, and it seems to be uh, I think helping in terms of uh, assuring a more uh, robust and timely response to these situations. And uh, I think I'm getting close to uh, the end of uh, what I wanted to share with you, but uh, just a little bit more in terms of, um, of uh, actions to improve the customer experience, especially in situations of, of delay or, or uh, service disruption. And uh, one of those is related again with regard to communications and we're piloting something right now on Acela. Um, that is reaching out to customers directly, again, proactively when a delay is occurring. And, uh, you know, these are for relatively, you know, smaller delays, but still disruptive delays, especially on a high, on a uh, premium product like Acela, where uh, we are um, uh, reaching out to customers, uh, offering uh, Amtrak guest rewards, uh, points as a as a uh, as an apology and uh, that uh, is seems to be well received and we're in we're hoping to expand that um, uh, more broadly and I think that that uh, has been successful um, our contact center we were we were constrained this summer um, and uh, we have made some really good progress in terms of uh, hiring and and getting resource back in place we are uh, uh, focusing on our Philadelphia uh, contact center and our, you know, we still have some uh, uh, third party support for uh, call center uh, volume, but we are really focusing on growing our Amtrak uh, resource and, uh, and we've had really good success in getting our uh, performance metrics improved in the contact center. Uh, in terms of the operations center, um, in the coming year, a, a, a service disruption desk uh, is going to be executed that will really focus on uh, these uh, significant disruption events in a more comprehensive way uh, and have uh, individuals whose, whose core accountability is to make sure that those processes work well and that the uh, situations are thoughtfully handled, um, and I think you know we we do uh, we do a good job with that. We don't always you know we're not as as consistent, and I think having a centralized team will be an important part of improving that consistency and making sure that we that we always do it right. Um, and that'll be uh, supported by a case management tool that will be deployed uh, that allows us to much more effectively track. Um, what we do and what service recovery we put in place and how it's received um, and, and follow through consistently across the organization. And so some of this is just uh, really aligning uh, through uh, tools and technology, the efforts that uh, occur in different, in disparate parts of the organization. Uh, and uh, really think that's gonna be an important step forward. And finally, with regard, uh, as we talked about earlier, capacity recovery, you know, we are uh, uh, getting the people we need, hitting the uh, staffing targets that will allow us to uh, restore capacity uh, consistent with our FY23 plan um, that, uh, that continues to make uh, good and steady progress. And Jim, over to you. Larry, thank you for, for doing this. I, uh, and, and there's a, a pretty significant lag, I think. So um, we'll, we'll work through that. Um, but I just, we have a bunch of questions. Better. Okay. <laughs> there's a bunch of questions uh, queued up here for us, but I, I do wanna start, I just wanna make an observation or two before we do that. Um, the service disruption desk, I think that's a great idea. Um, I'm not sure a lot of customers would um, would agree that it's been pretty good up to now. I don't think 
most customers would say that if I'm being candid. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, a situation like we had on the Wolverine, uh, I mean, I just, we, we know what happened and you and I, you know, we've talked about that for today. Yeah. Um, and uh, certainly from, from our point of view, we just can't have something like that happen ever again. And uh, so I think having that service disruption desk, having the, uh, the, the plan, the, the head and power plan that you outlined, you know, those, those are the kinds of steps that, that we want to see, we would like to see, um, and we hope you don't have to use them. That's, that's really what we're shooting for here. Um, but, but again, I think, ha and having the, the senior involvement uh, early on in the process, I think is also important. I think uh, so. So we're, we're glad to see that happen, um, but uh, we we have to we have to work harder on that. We just have to. Um, we just cannot let that kind of thing go by. Um, so you you had a, a bunch of really interesting things in the slides, um, and uh, I guess a couple of, of smaller points I wanted to bring up to sort of condense some of these questions. Sure. Um, Certainly, on the uh, capacity restoration, a lot of a lot of our folks seem to be wondering about firm dates. I didn't. I know we don't really have any firm dates. Um, you noted uh, just in I think it was the last slide. Uh, we're going to take every opportunity to increase sort of the production on yeah. getting those, those cars restored and so forth. Can Can you take us through briefly? I mean, we're looking at a procurement for new equipment in 24. Um, yeah. We're also looking at restoration. Um, how much of this is gonna be replacement and how much of this is gonna be growth? I mean, you know, we had a brief with Stephen, gosh, two years ago, I think it was, um, with some fairly ambitious growth targets in terms of fleet. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, is it a one for one or I, I'm kind of where, where is that shaping up? I know we're early in the process, but I think we, we're all curious what we're looking at here, what the scope is, what we're looking at. No, it, well, I think it is early, Jim, and the the initial intention is focusing on the replacement, and it really is broadly defined as the you know all of the long distance needs. Some of the equipment may have a life you know that can extend beyond, but depending on on you know what equipment we acquire and you know compatibility and by the time it all shows up you know even even our less than aged equipment will be <laughs> that much further along uh in in their in their life by you know by call it the mid 20 or 30s um which is you know we don't know exactly what the timeline is going to look like for fleet delivery in terms of growth i mean the uh there's both the capacity on the existing routes, and then there's the, you know, our engagement with the FRA on the, on the long distance route study that they're leading um, in terms of potential network opportunities. Um, you know, the, the, from the fleet procurement standpoint, we will be able to address that just in you know whether that gets reflected as options that the company can exercise for for growth in the future uh, or or if there are decisions that are made in advance of the completion of the uh, of the initial order then you know they perhaps there could be growth uh, to support network growth as part of that but i think at this point it is still early in the process and our focus is on you know what we need to uh, deliver the service on the network today and what and to, to make it as good as it can be. Okay. And um, I get a couple of specific questions here, but a lot of folks ask the same one. Um, okay. Can you bring us up to speed on the situation with the Adirondack? What's happening with the Adirondack? I mean, we're, we're seeing the transborder crossings happen elsewhere. Um, yeah. What's happening there? Yeah, I, I don't have the, the deep details. I know there have been a number of, uh, of complications, um, both on the Canadian side and on the US side, 
Um, we are still expecting to restore service, uh, I think, now in the spring. Um, uh, but a, you know, a final and official timeline, I think, is still contingent on uh, you know making sure all the pieces line up. But I, I think we're getting we're getting close, and uh, I would expect that it it'll be back back online sooner rather than later. We hope. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I think I think spring is our is our uh, latest and current view of what we expect. So whether that's March or April. You know, it's in that period. Okay. All right. Um, you know, you're talking about hiring. Uh, it feels like a great opportunity to address the mix of employees in 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 the company. Um, mm -hmm. You know, bringing so many people in, you have a lot of people, unfortunately, leaving. I mean, I'm hoping that that 1600 number we saw for folks leaving turns into something a lot less in the coming year because we need to kind yeah. of. We want that hiring to keep sort of filling in the gaps. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it feels like this is a good time to, you know, use this as a process to also handle um, diversity, equity, inclusion issues, um, you know, weighted preferences for, for certain types of workers, union workers, for example. Um, is, is, can you speak to that at all or share anything on that? Um, well, yeah, it, uh, well, I, I wanted to, by the way, I wanted to introduce uh, my colleague who is uh, in, in the shadows with me here, I'm sitting across from me, but Mariah Morales from our uh, government affairs team is with us. Oh, there she is. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but anyway, and, and you know, uh, I want to thank her for uh, 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 being here and being uh, supporting this team and and Jim, you know, we're really happy just to be uh, uh, having a, a con uh, continuous and and frequent dialogue with you about uh, about the issues that are concerned to you and and your members. Um, but uh, and did you hear that question? I did. <laughs> I did, and I threw over some new notes because I just recently did an update on what we're doing on the workforce side. Um, I think um, as you and I have talked about, Jim, there's a lot going on. You're right, we're staffing up. Uh, we've actually added almost 4,000 employees in the last year. So FY22, it's about 3,728, something like that. Um, and um, we are doing all the things that you're, you're, I think your audience is thinking about. It's, it's how do we get the new next generation workforce in the door? Um, I know somebody had said something in that question about unions and prioritize, prioritizing uh, union members, about 80% of the folks that we've hired in the last year are unions. In fact, most of our workforce is uh, represented by a union, uh, only managers. So about 2,000 are, at, you know, in the current mix are, um, are not part of a labor organization. So, um, you know, majority of the folks that we employ here are represented. Um, we have really done everything from engage folks um, at trade schools, community colleges, universities. We've reached out to the military, about 1800 of our employees currently um, were, you know, came to us from a military background. Um, you might recall, Jim, you and I uh, have talked to quite a bit about the apprenticeship programs that we uh, recently launched and we're doing everything we can to continue to grow those. They've been, I think, really popular. Folks are very interested in them. We're getting great feedback from the students. We just worked with Delaware um, on something that's more like a, a, a pre, um, like almost like an, a, an internship for folks that are thinking about a career in the railroad. So uh, we're calling it Railroading 101, and that is really being developed as we speak with the state of Delaware Department of Labor. Uh, and that would be some of the basic skills uh, folks might um, need to brush up on to get ready for a future career in the railroad. Um, and then internally, we really looked at how we think about relationships within the organization. So we have a number of employee resource groups that we've stood up over the last several years, and those are um, groups that are available to both, um, you know, folks represented by unions and management employees. Um, I, I think, you know, um, my gosh, it's been maybe five or six years ago, uh, myself and uh, Caroline Decker set up uh, Notch 8 which was the first uh, women's professional development group. Uh, and I think I just uh, pulled the roster and we're at over 500 folks 
uh, that are participating in that. Um, you know, we have a nothing, I always say from the Notch 8 perspective uh, that we have nothing but opportunity. There's, you know, 18,000 uh, union employees and about 2,000 managers. So, you know, I'm only uh, capturing a small portion of those, but it's all, all these organizations are of course volunteer. Uh, but I think whoever asked this question, you're asking the right question. Uh, we are going to need more people. Uh, we're going to need the future of the railroad that's part of the railroad. And um, I think I'm very excited about what we're doing here to try and attract new folks, grow the next generation workforce, and make sure that the folks that are already here are getting some of the support and relationships and partnerships and investment that they need. So um, you didn't know you were getting everything on earth when you asked that question. <laughs> yeah. I know we and we've had that we have had that conversation before. So yeah, thanks for that, Mariah. Um, so one thing I do want to come back to uh, one part of of the conversation. Some of the earlier slides, um, it was it was a tantalizing slide, talking about restoring coach uh, passengers to the dining car. You know that that's been uh, our big issue, and I know it 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 has been a little bit of a, a a challenge, we'll call it that, uh, but we we do think it's extraordinarily important. Sort of teased the idea that we're we're, we're looking at the uh, the silver services and uh, the crescent kind of in the the winter early part of the year. I mean, can we can we really start thinking about a, a public timeline for getting coach passengers into the dining car in some fashion? I mean, I know you got the pilot program going. We've talked about that internally and how that's going. Um, seems like pretty good data so far. I, I, yeah. I feel like there's not a lot of obstacles. So, I mean, can we get some kind of timeline on when we're gonna get the coach passengers back into the dining car and when we're gonna get uh, traditional dining um, system-wide as opposed to just on the silvers? Yeah, well, uh, a couple of things there, Jim. First of all, uh, I mean, the, the uh, the rollout of traditional dining uh, beyond the routes that that uh, we've discussed is not a decision that's been taken or a commitment that's been made. Um, you know, we want to improve uh, dining services everywhere, uh, but we also have, uh, you know, uh, practical uh, uh, issues and limitations that we need to take into account, and uh, we're doing, you know, we're we're addressing where we think it's the, where it makes the most sense. Um, and uh, we'll take it one step at a time. Um, and uh, unfortunately, as you mentioned the Crescent, uh, we, that's not in our immediate plans, Jim, um, but we'd still wanna continue to improve uh, the quality of the service on all of our trains. With regard to the coach um, uh, access, to dining, so we are with the rollout to the traditional dining routes. I think is the is the next milestone. Um, it's a fair question, and you know the only reason that we haven't, uh, I think, been able to be more definitive about it is because we are still struggling with, uh, you know, with uh, spot issues of of resource availability, and we don't want to commit to something that we can't deliver on effectively. And so that's why we've slow walked it a little bit is just to make sure that we have the, the, the personnel uh, and that they're ready to go to, to execute on the, on the new offering. Um, but I will do my best, Jim, to, to get you a little more firm, firm date uh, and route by route of what our intentions are. Okay, I mean, so again, when we talk about resource, it sounds more like it's staffing than it is, it's not about commissaries or that kind of thing. It's just about getting the humans on the train to deliver the service. Yeah, it, it's primarily the, you know, making sure we have uh, the the OBS, the onboard staff that we need to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, the clock is telling me that we are out of time. Ah. Um, we, we have an awful lot of questions um, kind of queued up here. Uh, is there any chance that we can ship those off to you and uh, have you guys chunk through those questions and get some answers back to us and we can share them with with everyone who's been with us today? 
we will we will certainly do what we can. Yeah, that would be happy to take a look at that, Jim. Um, and I just want to thank you for for inviting us to be with you. Um, you know, we are really grateful for uh, what the RPA does and for the support uh, of you and and your team in terms of uh, 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 support for Amtrak's annual grant and uh, all of the funding that uh, that Congress uh, provides and that you guys are an important part of. Uh, making, uh, keeping the focus on that support. Um, and so, uh, and really, uh, Jim, too, as well, uh, the work that you provided on the ICT uh, engagement on the mock-ups, uh, it's, it's really great to have you uh, as a part of that. Um, I wanted to just shout out to Maddie as well, who's been an active participant in our uh, F&B working group. And thank uh, thank her for that uh, for that uh, involvement and the recommendations that will be coming out of that uh, early in next year. So, Jim, thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, great. I appreciate uh, appreciate this uh, time that you spent with us today, Larry and Mariah. Appreciate your stepping in there in the corner, and um, we'll make sure you have some of these uh, questions in front of you. Maybe we can get some answers back for the great. folks on the day. Uh, but for now, we are out of time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we will talk with you all very soon. You have a, a good time. Joe, you are up. All right, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, thank you Mariah. Oh, there's a quick echo. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for attending. Um, be sure to uh, stick around. Uh, stay tuned to uh, relpastors.org slash events um, for what our next uh, webinar will be after, after the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, we'll have you know, more information uh, coming soon. So uh, that said, uh, thank you for attending. Uh, have a wonderful, safe holiday uh, season, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.